In early 2018, a relatively small parcel of land along the iconic Canal Street in New Orleans finally saw shovels in the ground after years of stalled proposals. The 350-room Hard Rock Hotel was well underway, and by 2019 was just topping off rising nearly 20 floors. I should know, as during the filming of my documentary Close for Storm, I was there. What I wouldn't know is that less than a month later, the structure would suffer a catastrophic partial collapse, sending debris flying, killing three workers, and opening up a mountain of legal scrutiny for those who were responsible. My name is Jake, and in this episode of Cancelled, we'll take a look at why this happened, who was to blame, and what ended up happening to the Hard Rock Hotel, New Orleans. This video is sponsored by Nebula. Get 40% off an annual subscription by going to nebula.tv slash brightsunfilms. So the site, 1031 Canal Street, has had a storied history like much of downtown New Orleans. Since the 1930s, a Woolworth store had occupied the land. Adorned with beautiful Art Deco design motifs, it was a popular downtown department store. It was also significant due to its role in 1960, as Woolworth's diner was the site of a lunch sit-in, protesting the racial disparity in New Orleans. It was the first one to happen within the city, and it started a wave of protesting against Jim Crow laws across the area. Ultimately, the store would close in the mid-90s as a part of a company-wide decline, and the space would sit vacant for years, changing hands a few times until 2005, when the structure was flooded following Hurricane Katrina. Still label-scarred with Woolworth, its interiors were destroyed, and would continue to sit that way, abandoned and awaiting new development. By 2007, the building and its land was purchased for $3.6 million by an organization called Kalis Companies. They were a decently large development company in New Orleans, with many of their key executives made up of the Kalis family. The plan was to build a large condo building on the site, ultimately asking city council to raise the height limits from 70 feet to 190 feet. It was 2011 by this point, and after many delays in getting the votes needed by council, the proposal was finally passed. However, it wasn't without controversy, especially two years later, as in December of 2013, it was revealed that Praveen Kalis, one of the main family members overseeing this project, pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit theft, admitting that he stole money from the Katrina Recovery Program. This was a very bad look. But city councillors essentially looked the other way, as they saw this as just one family member committing that crime, and saw great potential in what they were trying to do at the 1031 site. The proposed development could inject much-needed economic fuel into the city and Canal Street. So the project moved forward, and in October of 2014, it started with the demolition of the former Woolworth building. At the cost of $70 million, the proposed structure was honestly pretty ugly. It was visualized as a large 19-story tower, consisting of over 255 condos, most of which with small windows and all covered with blue and beige cladding. Some ground-level retail stores and a large open lobby area would line canal. This proposal was ultimately revised by the time the former Woolworth store was demolished. Replacing it would be a similarly sized tower set to contain the same amount of condos within. This version, while still looking pretty dated, had some better amenities like outdoor terraces, a rooftop pool, and balconies. With the land now cleared and presumably ready for development, nothing really happened. The site was dormant, with a lack of financing cited as the main issue. The parcel would continue to sit that way, abandoned for a few more years as developers searched for additional development partners. They actually found one in February of 2018, officially announcing their partnership with Hard Rock International, a massive hospitality company with a chain of restaurants, hotels, and casinos. This would turn the development into the Hard Rock Hotel New Orleans and now blend a hotel into the development proposal, including 350 hotel guest rooms, but still retaining some of the private condos, leaving just 62 of them. They would now become the residences at the Hard Rock Hotel New Orleans. Two ballrooms would also be injected into this plan, totaling 12,000 square feet of dynamic meeting space. To tie off the whole project, a few restaurants and a rooftop bar and lounge would literally top off the hotel and residence. Really, the exterior design of the structure didn't really change that much. In fact, the concept art for the building just saw Hard Rock logos slapped onto it. Now, some further height requests were made, but the city denied them. We'll talk about that later. Nevertheless, with the plan locked in and financing secured, construction finally started on the Hard Rock Hotel in New Orleans. 
months. While an opening date of spring 2019 was rather looking unlikely, construction was well underway by March of 2018. As the building began to rise along Canal Street, some problems were beginning to rise with it. The opening date would be pushed back to 2020, but as construction picked up and the structure began taking shape, in September of 2019, the electricians union hired for the project began protesting the conditions on the construction site. They claimed that project leaders had hired unlicensed and unqualified electricians as well as miscategorized contract workers, essentially leaving them without insurance. Now, other sheer signs of negligence and likely critical errors and decisions were made during this time, and of course we'll talk about those later. But workers within were taking troubling videos of temporary shoring poles bending after the penthouse floor's concrete had been poured. 180 feet below was me. I was actually out on Canal Street with a few of my colleagues shooting some b-roll for my documentary. It's called Close for Storm, and it's about the history of the abandoned Six Flags New Orleans theme park. This was our second trip there, and we had just wrapped up one of the last interviews for the film. On one of our last days there, we had just decided to go out on the afternoon of September 18th to shoot some footage that we actually never ended up using. In the background of some of those shots, you can see the structure eerily still intact. 24 days later, on October 12th, 2019, disaster struck. At 9.12 a.m., the northern corner of the top floors suffered a catastrophic and sudden failure. Once the beams holding up the floors began to buckle, more and more critical supports began to fail. The enormous weight of these concrete floors began a domino effect and sent thousands of tons of steel and concrete pancaking on top of each other, especially with the added weight of heavy construction materials on the roof at the western corner. Construction workers flee from the collapse, and from the ground, Canal and Rampart Street is a disaster zone. The collapsing concrete floors cascade down the structure, ripping through the exterior insulation and sending a large section of the facade tumbling down. The buck hoist or construction elevator detached from the structure and falls across Rampart Street, puncturing the roof of the Sanger Theater. The whole collapse was only around 30 seconds, but the resulting damage was shocking. In the end, 30 people were injured, and tragically, three construction workers were killed. With the surrounding streets covered in dust, the construction site was in utter devastation. The collapse made national and even worldwide news, many of which brought in experts who were already very critical on how something like this can happen in our modern times. While officials began their search for who was responsible, the immediate concerns were what to do with the structure and how to get the trapped and deceased workers out of the building. Members of police and fire departments were worried about further collapse, and justifiably assumed the entire hotel was completely unstable. Meanwhile, another massive concern was about the two cranes. They held their place as the building crumbled around them, but of course, that caused a great deal of anxiety on how much longer they would stay like that. They could come crashing down at any time. It didn't help that Tropical Storm Nestor was forming in the Gulf, and could bring gusty winds to the area. So the city expedited their plans to remove the cranes, and began work with a plan to carefully set off charges to fold the cranes over the existing tower. Though, it didn't exactly go to plan. Yeah, so on October 20th, just a little over a week after the initial collapse, those explosives went off, and while the west crane did fall onto the building, the east crane most certainly did not. It came crashing down onto Rampart Street, standing almost vertically. The collapse didn't cause too much damage otherwise, and the city and their mayor turned to recovering the two bodies trapped within the structure, and then getting it demolished altogether. Though, that was a difficult task, as workers would later need to send in robots to chip away at pieces while dangling from carriages above. By early 2020, nothing substantial had been done. Protests then erupted on speeding up the demolition process. Weirdly enough, I was there once again during this time, filming the last few segments for my documentary. From various vantage points, I observed the partial collapse, and it was truly staggering on how massive it was. It was incredibly surreal to see, especially with a section of Canal Street closed because of it. 
By this point, the city had racked up a bill of well over $11 million. And despite a lawyer on behalf of 1031 Canal Development, the holding company set up for the hotel and owned by the Kalis companies, saying that they were paying that money off, the city claimed that they had not received a cent. These developers were also disagreeing with the city on who will lead the demolition and how it will all come down. But work finally then got started in March of 2020. First, with the demolition of the two historic buildings beside the site. They were taken down due to safety hazards, and by summer, crews began disassembling the mangled steel on the tower. After 10 months since the collapse, crews also recovered the final body that was trapped within the rubble. Aside from a small fire, serious demolition work got underway without any problems, and by the one-year anniversary, much of the tower above the parking garage was slowly being taken down. By early 2021, the stronger concrete on the first few floors of the parking garage were chipped away, and the site was mostly cleared by April. This was a pretty massive accident that cost the lives of several people, injured others, and had altered the lives of the family members for those who were lost. As many claimed immediately after the accident, modern construction sites don't just collapse for one reason. There was serious neglect, and investigators wanted to find out who was at fault. So, the search was on. 1031 Developments and their owners, the Kalis family, were already facing multiple lawsuits, including one from the city of New Orleans. It was also revealed that Kalis had hired undocumented immigrants and committed other minor infractions. They obviously pled their innocence, stating it was material and engineering factors that led to the disaster. And, well, they're likely not wrong about that. In OSHA's report on the accident, a major design flaw was uncovered. See, the top three floors were always going to feature penthouses with higher ceilings. From the very start, developers got the approval to raise the height restrictions to 190 feet, which would not only allow for a taller building, but allow for these penthouses to have some extra room. However, once Hard Rock signed on to the project and added all of those extra amenities like a rooftop pool, Kalis went to the city again to raise the height another 10 feet, making the tower 200 feet in total. This would allow those penthouses to each have very tall 13-foot ceilings. However, the city wasn't willing to give them any additional height allowances, and they were forced to keep that 190-foot restriction. But they still wanted to keep those high penthouse ceilings, and to do that, they would need to fit thinner beams that support the floors above. Thinner beams for the floors means higher ceilings, getting to that 13-foot ceiling height despite the tower only being 190 feet. In addition to this, the decking, which is the metal sheets that concrete for the floors would be poured on top of, was originally slated for 16 gauge. However, as WWLTV reports, without the approval from the city, it was changed to a much thinner 22 gauge, over 66% thinner, making the cost of the material much cheaper, but also far weaker. A change like this would be fine as long as the space between the walls and the steel beams were properly supported with additional columns. However, the final construction plans showed that only one extra support was put in for two floors. Engineers who spoke to WWLTV claimed that those floors would likely need double the columns that were already in place, and the results of not doing so aren't all that hard to understand. If the space between the walls and the beams weren't supported, a heavy load in this vulnerable area made so by the thin decking could potentially cause catastrophic damage, and it may explain why these temporary shoring poles were beginning to bend. And there were even more errors identified, like balconies not having rebar in them like they probably should have, and when steel beams that were ordered came in short and the bolt holes weren't matching up, they were just welded together. According to OSHA, they did not meet the specified load requirements. In fact, the stress load on them likely exceeded several hundred percent on what they were designed to withstand. There was also negligence on the city's end as well, as inspectors failed to make site visits even though they approved critical aspects of the construction, like the penthouse concrete pour. Investigations also found that some of the visits they actually made were done by unqualified city inspectors, signing off on stuff they didn't have a full understanding of. 
The cherry on top was the fact that the New Orleans Permit Office doesn't have an engineer on staff that would look for issues in the submitted blueprints. It's possible that if they did have someone there, they could have raised the red flag on these unsupported floors. OSHA moved forward with issuing serious fines against the project's engineer and the steel supplier. As for criminal charges, it wasn't exactly as swift as citizens and family members would have hoped. In June 2021, the lead investigator for the criminal case was abruptly fired by the New Orleans Inspector General, due to, in my opinion, some silly reasons, like standing too close to the Deputy Inspector General during COVID social distancing, conducting work from her boyfriend's apartment even though she was quarantining after contracting the disease, and for a few other reasons, all of which she had alibis for. Regardless, she did an enormous amount of work, and even finished her report which she was going to recommend criminal charges at the time she was fired. This set the new investigators back who had to build a brand new report and try and replicate some of her work. Meanwhile, the district attorney's office claimed that they wanted to hold people accountable. That's great, but they said they needed more evidence, which they claimed to be would be in OSHA's full unreleased report. The only problem was that OSHA was not going to hand over that report since it was being used in other litigation. This whole mess just tied up the system for literally years, and to the families of those who were lost detriment it was announced that a grand jury decided there was not enough evidence to build a criminal case against anyone. Nobody in this disaster would be held accountable. So what's going to happen to the actual site now? Well, at this point, the land sits vacant. It's partially used for parking, and there are some foundational scars over top the land, with just the nubs of steel where the cranes used to stand. Kalis, the original developer, in fact still owns the site, and they don't want it to stay like this. In fact, they want to get going on another development, potentially once again with Hard Rock. The city councilors, however, do not want that, and they rescinded the height allowances, putting the restrictions back to 70 feet. They made it clear that they do not want another high-rise built with those original exceptions. Kalis responded by suing the city, and the outcome of that is apparently still ongoing. This whole disaster was a complete mess that started from the day shovels went into the ground. From my critical eyes, this was an ugly building that was pushing the limits of what the city wanted, pushing the limits of how things would be done, seemingly cutting costs where they could, and trying to squeeze all of these plans in with a tight and stressful timeline towards the end. With all of the facts that were dug up during this investigation, it is pretty shocking and very upsetting that nobody has been held criminally accountable. And that's pretty shameful, as this whole thing affected a lot of people. It cost the taxpayers millions, caused damage to an iconic street, which in turn made small businesses lose out on customers, injured 30, and killed 3 people. They lost their lives over this, and it's pretty shocking how incompetently it was all handled. I mean, the developers dropped the ball, the engineers dropped the ball, the steel suppliers, the city inspectors, the permit office, the district attorney, inspector general, everyone dropped the ball on this. It's truly an astounding series of events that have all led to this promising new Hard Rock Hotel to be cancelled in the most devastating way. Oh my god. If you find engineering projects both successful and unsuccessful interesting, then you may like a brand new Nebula original that I love on the B2 Bomber. It's from a personal favorite creator of mine, Mustard, and this gives you a fascinating look at the geopolitical and technical circumstances that led to the B2's creation. It's one of the most sophisticated and expensive flying machines in existence, and one that arguably was a failure based on how much the program cost. Of course, since this is a Nebula original, it can only be found on Nebula. Nebula is a creator-made platform where you can find high-quality original shows from your favorite online creators. My videos are also there, ad-free, and released a few days before they are here on YouTube. Additionally, there's also Nebula Classes, a collection of unique, high-quality courses to learn from your favorite content creators. All of this is included with a Nebula subscription, and if you sign up using the link on the screen and in the description below, you can both support me directly and get access to Nebula and Nebula Nebula classes, all for 40% off an annual plan. That comes out to just $2.50 a month. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.